All right, Dr. Picos, welcome back. Um, Dr. Picos, how do you decide upon the type of graft material you place in the sinus? As an example, when do you use GEM21 versus autogenous and xenograft and then Nova Bone? <laughs> okay, I, I don't, for, for lateral augmentation, I don't use um, um, anything but uh, a demineralized dollar graft, specifically Mineros in the last 13 years. Uh, prior to that, it was Puros. But uh, it's a cortical cancellous gradient, as I talked about, in a 50-50 mix with, with the xenograft, with BioOS. And that's been my protocol for 28 years. And the, the rationale is that the xenograft acts as that skeletal matrix we talked about, like coral. It doesn't go away. I've got cores at 25, 26 years out now where the xenograft is there, and it, it's, it's beautifully um, bridged to autogenous bone. And the allograft will be res replaced completely by the patient's own bone. So that's the rationale for that, fit, that uh, particular combination. Uh, I've, acted, I've, I've added bioactive modifiers over the past 22 years from PRP to PRGF to PRF, only to increase angiogenesis, period. Uh, I don't put GEM21 into a sinus. I don't put Novavone into a sinus. Only in the crestal, in the crestal uh, sinus graft do I use uh, Novavone, only because it's a putty that's radiographically visible. I can see and verify, as I showed you, that I've tented the membrane correctly without perforation. Uh, Etc. And it does turn over, so um, that's pretty much the rationale there. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Urban. You show cases during your grafting where you aggressively scrape and root plane the adjacent tooth roots adjacent to your bone graft. At what point do you worry that the bone loss around the adjacent tooth root may compromise your bone graft? In other words, how much bone loss on an adjacent tooth where you would be better extracting the tooth? Well, it's a very good question, but it's also individualized. Um, we have published um, two papers, and uh, one paper we, um, actually three, but one paper we uh, addressed this interproximal bone loss, which was, I would say, probably two to three millimeters, but more like two millimeters of, a good two millimeters of interproximal bone loss and zero papilla. And that we addressed with a soft tissue graft and a, a growth factor on the root, okay? And that we have now the 15 year follow up on that case that looks perfect. But that case, we could have extracted the tooth, but we did not. We published another paper where we had two cases when we um, grafted on the denuded root and uh, also long term follow ups and we gained um, like a millimeter and a half of a bony peak that is radiologically there even after a decade. In general, uh, that we do that ve we do very rarely attempt to regenerate bone and then we root. If we attempt, then we go maximum like we get like a millimeter and a half. Okay, but in general, I would say if depending on not only the bone loss but how the papilla is, how the entire case is, how the smile line is, how uh, <clears throat> you know which tooth is that. Okay, like a center incisor, I have a hard time to extract. But if I have like three millimeters of bone loss, I have zero papilla, and it's a long span defect already, then I will very likely extract it. If I have one tooth defect, then I try to do something with that tooth not to get extracted. Uh, but of course, when I have also buccal palatino bone loss and like three millimeters of bone loss in the proximal, I think it's easier to extract. Dr. Picos, can you please explain your suturing technique with the acellular dermal matrix used as the free gingival graft during your vestibuloplasty? Sure. With regard to the ADM uh, the plasty AD uh, mm -hmm. protocol, sure. The, the apically repositioned flap um, is secured basically no different than what Isvan showed. It's an apically repositioned split thickness um, flap that's... Um, Suture I typically had been using uh, chromic suture uh, three zero on large FS two needle to get a nice good bite to secure it to muscle. Um, in the last probably two years, I've worked more with um, uh, a different resorbable um, suture, but uh, it it really does not matter. But it's it's more of a three zero cr uh, chrome. I'm sorry, um, thickness, and yet in the AEDM I secure with uh, four zero. Um, 
chromic suture. Um, glycolon has been the suture material that I've worked with in the past couple years now in lieu of the chromic. Either one works well, but it's a P3 needle. It's a small needle that's necessary to suture the ADM connective tissue side down. Very important. And, um, and that's secured uh, in all the corners of that graft and even centrally. And uh, as this one showed, it's kind of interesting, and that's what was one of the reasons that I really wanted us to be together, to show and contrast the different things that we've done over the years. It's been 18 years I've used ADM in that V-plasty uh, format and gotten 50% literally of uh, shrinkage. In other words, you want that 5 to 7 millimeter band we talked about, I will apically reposition 10 to 12 millimeters routinely, and then just watch that come back. And that tissue color, as we talked about, blends in beautifully. Uh, it's a mucosal looking immobile tissue and in about 40% of the cases it will uh, become keratinized. It's interesting. On the surface. Now what I've only done once, which I'll do now more times after watching Isvan to be able to see exactly what's under that tissue is take some samples, some strips and see exactly uh, what the histo will show us. Uh, even though again on the surface it's pink looking mucosal but as Pat Allen has showed beautifully with his histology over the last 15-16 uh, years of his using ADM with root coverage cases and augmentations he's shown um, keratinized tissue below uh, the or keratinization rather below the surface so again it's I think it's an academic uh, argument in terms of whether it is exposed or not keratin uh, immobil immobility and mucosal and good aesthetics, rather, are the keys that we're after, certainly. Thank you. Sticking with soft tissue, Dr. Urban, when you are rotating the papilla and switching the papilla anteriorly to get your tension-free closure, what happens in the posterior site that is now missing the papilla? Yeah, the posterior site is not missing the papilla because I do the, the vertical incision is uh, basically... Um, Okay, now I, I understand more the question. Yeah, well, you just pull, you just pull in the, the soft tissue there from the distal, and, and, and the vertical incision, you close down the mucosa to the na neighboring tooth. So you're basically rotating some marginal tissue in there. And you're not elevating the interdental papilla and the palatinal side of the papilla, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, because you can, you can put any buccal tissue there that's going to take care of the papilla. Okay. As I showed some pictures also. Dr. Picos, why do you prefer to not use the PTFE membrane as you mentioned in the anterior aesthetic zone? I, I understood from your extraction site management that the PTFE helps create what you call attached tissue that may end up becoming keratinized. Uh, a, a cytoplasm memory mm -hmm. basically uh, only because, um, well, it, let me back up. You can't, it can be used I, can't, I will use it rarely when there's thick uh, a gingival phenotype and I'm not after any increase in thickness. But that said, that's probably 1% of my application. So virtually every other time I'm using autogenous tissue, either a free gingival plug for a thick phenotype case or virtually all everything else is a connective tissue graft because in those cases I'm augmenting tissue and changing phenotypes from thin to hybrid or even thick. All right. S sticking with membrane questions, Dr. Urban, there are so many different types of collagen membranes that are offered today on the market. Do you feel strongly that using the exact kind of membrane is important for your sausage technique? Does it really make a difference which resorbable membrane you use? Okay, it's a good question, and uh, you know I, I can have a sub subjective answer, right? Because I like this connect uh, this this collagen membrane. I use this collagen. I really like the collagen this collagen membrane because of the flexibility of this membrane, but. That, you know, potentially you could use something else, I'm sure. Uh, if you don't like this and you want to use something else, I mean, check something that has to be, you know, elastic, and there's very few of them that are elastic. So uh, the, I wouldn't use that something that would, be, that would be very rigid. I wouldn't use something that would be cross-linked. I would, you know, I'm using this membrane, you know, which is the BioGuide for the last... I, as, I, as I mentioned to you, I started six, 2006 with the study with it. So 13 years, it works. I mean, I don't see why I would change it. Okay. Dr. Picos, this question is directed to you, but perhaps you both could answer this. I wanted to make sure this got in. There was a lot of questions about uh, anti-resorptive medications, Boniva, Prolia, even some bisphosphonate. This is a huge topic, but just briefly, what are you doing to 
evaluate these patients in your practice and when to proceed with surgery or not? Is, can you condense an answer for that broad subject? Well, the short answer is I don't think anybody knows exactly uh, how to deal with the, um, the non-oral, um, I should say the or oral meds that, that are involved, specifically like Fosamax. You know, I've used a CTX peptide test for many years, and, um, and there's really no other marker that we have available to us, and it's been pretty bulletproof for me. Um, and I use the, the, the number of 100 as not so much the 150 number that Marks has talked about, meaning if I'm 100 or more, so far I've batted pretty much 100% with grafting, implant placement, et cetera, in these individuals. In other words, if that, if that number comes back, it's in um, it's 100 or more, um, Michael Moles, I believe, is them forgetting now the actual um, unit, but not important. But that hundred number is important, I believe. Comes below that, we'll give them, put them on a drug holiday, et cetera, et cetera, and it will usually go up to the over hundred number. And I've not seen any issues with regard to uh, the necrotic issue that we all are certainly are aware of. Now that said, the IV meds are, of course, in a whole different category. We don't know a lot about prolia. So many drugs, we just don't know. So it becomes a very difficult problem, I think, for all of us. I don't have any real pat answer for, for those. But the, the CTX peptide, I know there's a big school of thought that says that's, you know, hogwash doesn't really um, have good application, et cetera. Uh, for me and for our group, um, we've still used it. Two good references, the 2014 Amos position paper that came out talking about the anti-resorptives, and that's available online, and then also the Bob Marks second edition yeah. book that you sense. reference. Okay. Dr. Erb. Okay. Triple O. Triple O. Thank you. Dr. Urban, any comment on your patient population with how you're approaching these growing number of patients on these anti resorptive medications? Yeah, we have only the blood test. And uh, I just seen the pay. I was in, in Finland actually two, three weeks ago. It was a little bit colder over there. And uh, they show, I've seen a case, uh, IV, bisphosphonate. And um, so they had to, they have to, they, they, I mean, this got exposed and, uh, you know, there was like, you know, like a rotten in place, so they resected the crest, I mean, really extensively. And then it came back and now they have to resect oh the maxilla up to the orbit. They have to remove the nose, they have to remove the entire maxilla, it's just the eyes that's gonna remain. I mean, it's like, I mean, I could not believe, you know, how aggressive this necrosis can be. All right. Um, Dr. Picos, you demonstrated an anterior case with the loss of two maxillary incisors where there was a loss of facial plate and a thin soft tissue biotype. You showed the case using mineralized allograft and subepithelial connective tissue grafting. To clarify, did you mix your mineralized graft with GEM21, PDGF, or just PRF exudate? Also, with the loss of facial plate, why didn't you use BMP? Okay, um, part one of that question is that was really not GEM21 at that time. If I had that case to do today, I would add recombinant PDGF because of that landmark case I showed you from 2007 that got me started using uh, that recombinant protein. Um, and again, it's off-label, but it works quite well. When a facial plate is out, that's my go-to uh, adjunctive bioactive modifier with my bone graft with Mineros. Now, I only use BMP in an extraction site when I've got a 3D defect, as I showed uh, a few cases especially in the maxilla where there's no plates, there's no plates to begin with. Extraction is, pellet, is uh, flapless, and we really rely on periosteum to do its thing in terms of, of having um, stem cell um, availability, et cetera. So BMP works extremely well in those cases, but it's an expensive, relatively speaking, product to use, so I don't waste it on an extraction socket when I can get similar results with different materials. So back to that case I showed, uh, that's now a 10-year-old case, and that was only Mineros with connected to geograph. No, no um, other back to modify, nothing else added to it. And yet it, it did work. Again, doing that case today, I get a more exuberant uh, result in terms of bone density and even maintenance of volume using the recombinant 
Jim 21. Now that said too, that's subjective. I have no study to show that, certainly not. But I will say this, that since the literature is so, you know, there's such a dearth of, of, of material on these different Bhakti modifiers, there have been some individuals even as of late that have, from main podiums, dissed everything. I mean everything, saying uh, all the bloodborne are garbage, even GEM21 and even recombinant BMP2 in terms of there are no real, you know, uh, lots of studies. More case, um, well, Bob Marks has certainly several studies. Craig Mission, I got together with Melmquist, as I showed you on that vertical study, etc. But just a handful of, of, um, of studies to, to, to more or less validate what we're doing. But again, what we're both showing are things and situations that applications of these different technologies are working quite well or we wouldn't even be doing them let alone teaching them as we do in our respective institutes so there's a lot to be said with getting too crazy on the evidence based element and that whole talk by the way recently was based on just that unless there's absolute unbelievable evidence to, to uh, in the literature to support what we're doing then we should only be using quote unquote autogenous bone well if that's the case then um, take the xenograft from this gentleman and take the BMP from me and basically we're reduced to pfft, not doing too much so I'll leave it at that thank you um, so we'll stick with bioactive modifiers Dr. Urban with all the data now available supporting the use of PRF specifically for soft tissue wound healing why have you not considered its use when you have either a fistula for soft tissue healing or when you might accidentally perforate through a flap like you showed on the pallet? Wouldn't PRF be an option for these types of defects specific to mm. soft tissue? Like, I would never treat a perforation with anything else than a connective tissue graft. Like, such a perforation that I showed, I think the connective tissue graft is a very predictable way of, of treating that. Uh, Maybe like an, something like an oloderm would be something resistant for that too. But I don't see why I would use PRF for, for that because like that I think might not, you know, maintain the, uh, the barrier effect for if I have a perforation. Okay, so um, yeah. All right. And I just want to add a quick comment to that. And I totally agree. PRF is not, it should not be used as a quote unquote membrane replacement for anything else. It's just a bioactive modifier that will will release cytokines over a period of typically seven, ten days, but it's not a barrier in and of itself. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Picos, when creating your flap for tension-free closure in maxilla with periosteal release and blunt hemostat dissection, any concern with damage to the infraorbital nerve with the hemostat when you're dissecting? There were a couple of questions about no, sure. infraorbital um, nerve concern. Absolutely, and, and just as this one showed nicely with his mini-me, I'm basically doing the equivalent of that with the hemostat. So once I'm through periosteum, I'm spreading muscle fibers very carefully with, with that hemostat in a vertical di direction. So when you're in and around the bundle, of course, you've got to be careful, and that's where I use the wet gauze with blunt dissection to stretch out the muscle fibers even more. Occasionally, we will have some, some transient V3, yes, um, especially on the larger uh, cases but it is transient it's it's not it's not permanent at least we've not had any yet um so a combination of sharp and then definitely blunt dissection being careful around the bundle certainly okay. dr urban how do you fixate a membrane in the posterior maxilla when there's a pneumatized sinus yeah i wanted to show that but <laughs> didn't have time at the end so on i i, I start fixating the um, the palatinal part and um, palatinal bone is you know, if you have to, if you go apical enough, it's usually dense enough that you can you can fix it the pins. On the buckle, however, sometimes it's really pneumatized and very very thin. So what I do, I do um, one large membrane, usually the 30 by 40, if I do a sausage like a large one, and the mesial pin is usually easy because it's more anterior maxilla where it's all more cortical bone. Once you go to the uh, to the top part. And it becomes very thin. And so in the master pin kit, there is a drill, a very thin one, which is for the pre-drilling of pinning, but I never use, except here. Uh, I go through with the burr, and I drill through the, above the, the, um, <clears throat> the sinus window. I drill through the bone, drill inside the sinus. And then 
I micro tap because then you like you, this becomes a pin that really just you almost push it in. Okay, it goes into the sinus, but you don't fracture enough the whole bone. If you're gonna hit this like without pre-drilling, you're gonna fracture the entire thing in there. Okay, so but if you pre-drill, you find the hole, you take your membrane over there, and then you just micro tap it. Then you just gently slide in. Okay, that's how I do it. <laughs> so that drill, what they put in the kit. It's good for this, it's not good for anything else. When you were showing the, the, the tacks that you use, were you taking the back side of the 15 blade between that instrument and, and keeping the tack where it is to allow the instrument yeah. to come off? Because yeah. so, sometimes it's, yeah. that tack will stay on so that instrument. That, that, that 15 C blade works with ev everything except the master pin, because the master pin is a special pin holder. But they have an extra instrument in the kit that you can, instead of the blade, you can put in there. Oh. It's a hockey stick instrument. But still, uh, yes, then, then I will always fixate that with, with the hockey stick instrument when I remove the pin holder. So is that your technique it. every time you remove the pin holder? You're putting that? Only in very, very soft bone. Only in soft bone, okay. In a hard bone, you don't have to. You just like rotate the pin holder and it lets it go. Thank you. Dr. Picos, a couple of questions about CBCT. Um, would you comment on quote unquote standard of care with respect to use of comb beam CT for single implant to full arch implant therapy, and also as a follow-up, if someone wanted to get more training or a course on CBCT, what would you recommend? Well, with regard to standard of care, I think it's important to appreciate that attorneys more or less establish that, like it or not. Uh, but that said, I mean, I had gone on record years back saying that I felt it was standard of care and kind of got laughed out of a room uh, as I recall, about 12 years ago. At any rate, uh, the long and short of it is, um, from a radiation perspective, um, I can tell you it's nothing. Uh, those of you that flew more than two hours to get here got more irradiation at 30,000 feet than one of these scans for most any unit now in the market. Uh, that's, a, that's for sure. You go out and get a few hours of sun here in Florida, same thing. Lots of radiation, more than the cone beam. So that's not an issue. As far as training goes, I I'm... I'm guessing there are a number of, um, of um, areas where one can go, uh, I should say institutes. Uh, we don't teach that, but um, there, I know through CareStream and through other um, groups, there are folks that uh, are teaching at least a one-day course in dental radiologists. Uh, you can work with beam readers, I'm sure, out in Sacramento. They could uh, guide you to uh, where to go. They did have courses at one time. I had taken one about 14 years ago with them. Um, they're in Sacramento. So that's about all I can recall off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's some other centers that are teaching that. Right. Dr. Urban, many of the cases you showed in the afternoon, the implants looked at least 10 millimeters, but yet many of the cases, the restorations were splinted. Do you feel this is helpful in your horizontal cases? No. It, I'm, you know, originally, you know, I was trained, you know, here. <laughs> and, and when I was trained here, it was a very traditional school, a very conservative school in terms of prosto. And we used to use a lot of external hex implants. And those external hex implants, they were not doing well when they were not sprinted, okay, because they were, like, moving. And so we started, there was a school of thought that you place, like, three implants and you splint them. And then, you know, the prostodontists back there, they picked it up and then they, they kept doing it. But I would say, of course, I think, as I mentioned yesterday, putting two implants and a bridge is sometimes better than three implants. And if you do three implants with the current, you know, configurations of the implants, you, can, you don't have to splint it. Yeah. You don't have to splint. I like the way this question is phrased. Dr. Picos, osteodensification by osteotome expansion versus reverse drills. Any comparison study, my osteotome is cheaper. <laughs> well. The short answer to that is there, there's, there's really some very interesting histology to, to back that uh, the, the microfractures that, that occur from osteotome um, usage uh, are pathologic versus the very physiologic effect of, of spreading bone incrementally, i.e. with, with uh, the osteodensification burrs. Those rakes and flutes and, and lands are, are, are configured in such a way that in low-density bone in a counterclockwise rotation, 
uh, you get a very interesting expansion uh, and actually the bone that is formed that's created in those flutes rather than be removed again is, is literally displaced into the marrow spaces in a centripetal motion. So that said, it's very physiologic and the micro CT studies that have been done, the beautiful histology that's, that validates everything is just absolutely exquisite to show uh, the, the physiologic expansion of bone um, versus any type of microfracturing that occurs with osteotomes. So the wound healing is accelerated and it's just more physiologic all the way around. There's just no comparison. Uh, anyone using osteotomes after you look at the osteotomification burrs, you really understand and appreciate clinically the field and the difference. And then the, again, the science will validate that. And there are many, uh, at least four or five different sheep studies that are coming out now that are going to be very supportive, even more so uh, long term effects uh, of what I just said. Dr. Urban, can you discuss your suture selection and time of removal during your soft tissue grafting techniques? Okay. So my, my, you know, my sutures are resolvable for the soft tissue grafting. I use a 6-0 glycolon. And for the apic liposition flap, I, I have the kind of like the, the apical sutures that are holding the flap up. It's a 5-0 glycolon. I use a 6-0 glycolon, and I'm going to receive from the company 7-0 resolvable suture that is like a brand new suture. I don't know what the name is going to be. Um, because to me, even the 6 is too thick. Occasionally, for a facial strip, I use a 7 non-resolvable Resolon suture that I remove very early, like in five days, because otherwise it's very difficult to remove. Uh, these resolvable sutures, I just, you know, cut the hair off, and that's it. I'm not, not removing them. Dr. Picos, two questions about your sinus grafting. The first is, do you remove the pins or the tacks at some point with your sinus grafting? The second part of the question um, is, can you review the antibiotic regimen for your sinus grafts that you give patients postoperatively? Sure. The pin fixation for, um, as I showed you, where I'm using uh, the 30 by 40 uh, non-crosslink membrane that has some uh, some rigidity to it to allow it to adapt but yet not be too soft. Uh, those, that fixation externally, um, I leave those pins. I don't, I don't go after them at all. They're titanium tacks that um, if in fact they begin to have some migration later um, years down the road at all, uh, they'll surface and they're almost like splinters. You can just take them right out of the mucosa, not a big ordeal. Um, with regard to the antibiotic regimen, uh, typically it's uh, in a non-allergic to penicillin patient, uh, it's Augmentin. That, that's absolutely the, the drug of choice. Amoxicillin is a waste of time uh, in today's uh, day and age. So you need that clavulanic acid uh, adjunctive um, boost. And if I have a perf, I'll add uh, flagell, uh, after, you know, right after the case and uh, right out of script for that. And that's a 500 milligram uh, TID for seven days. The, um, the um, Augmentin, I begin that a day before. It's a BID, 875. Starts one day before, day of, and then five more days. So that's the regimen that I use typically for a, a lateral approach. Crestal approach, uh, basically um, a MOX can work for sure because we don't anticipate a PERF, but if we're going to have a PERF, Augmentin would be the drug then again. So it's better to place them on the Augmentin even for a Crestal. Um, in case you do have a, um, a perf. A couple of questions about this, Dr. Urban. The ice cube graft technique, could you go hey. over that again? We have the ice cube, we have the iceberg, and we have the island. <laughs> okay? <laughs> there are uh, variations of this type of soft tissue graft for the papilla. Depending on the availability, if a patient has a big tuberosity, we remove the entire tuberosity. It becomes an ice cube. Okay, it's not just a little tuberosity, it's the tuberosity. And, uh, but rarely has a patient, you know, a very large tuberosity such as that. So then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so what we do is that we take the entire tuberosity out, deapitalize, suture in the back, and that's what we put in on where we need more of a papilla. We know that the, the tuberosity, actually we don't really like, a lot of people like the tuberosity grafts. In general, we don't use a lot of tuberosity grafts other than the papilla. And other when we really need some tough contouring, and the reason is that the tuberosity graft grows. 
I like if it's by papilla grows. But other than that, I don't like if it grows. It, it really can be ugly in about five to 10 years if you put it anywhere else, okay? Some people are just cutting tissue back because it just grows. It's a tuberosity. And uh, the other thing what we do is that we do like a double layer connective tissue grafts. And um, so, um, yeah, the ice cube is uh, not frequently available for the patients. It's such a, you know, but this patient had a beautiful one. I mean, that was like a really ice cube. When I took a picture of it, okay, this looks like an ice cube. So that's how he got the name. Dr. Picos, when doing large composite type defects in anterior maxilla where the patients lost both vertical and horizontal and you're using your titanium mesh, can you clarify when are you using xenograft mixed in with your BMP and allograft? Mm -hmm. That's, there's been more of an evolution for me with regard to using uh, the xenograft with uh, allograft for BMP. Um, I like about a 20% um, mixture of the, uh, 20 to 30% of the bioos to again, to maintain that uh, overall form and have stability long term. Uh, I've used the xeno allograft combination for more than 20 years now with the so-called um, veneer grafting as I've termed it. Uh, again, showing you those posterior sinus cases where I'll augment uh, sinus and the ridge same time. Any of those ridges, the xeno, again, doesn't go away. So the same thinking goes with, um, you know, with the BMP. It can be used, um, BMP only with the allograft or the expander, so to speak, and, and have that added uh, surface area for bone regeneration uh, as, as opposed to just the sponge, of course. Um, but in fact, in that study we did with um, our combined cases with uh, Craig Mish and Melmquist, uh, we, um, those cases were all allograft only and BMP. But I like the BioOS combination for more long-term stability, no, not having to expand the graft larger than we need to, in other words, anticipating some resorption. What I found with the adding the xenograft, just like the sinuses. You don't get renormalization in the sinus. What you see is what you get. It's almost the same thing with the, uh, the ridge augs. And you're both using the small particulate? Yeah. For, yes. for your I think xenograft? The large, I don't know why they make the large, yeah. honestly. Okay. I think just to make it cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dr. Urban, for ridge augmentation greater than five millimeters, do you recommend a resorbable collagen membrane over the perforated PTFE to allow communication with the graft or no collagen membrane? Okay, so um, that's a great question. Let me repeat that. So I use 100% of my cases, I put a collagen membrane on the perforated non resorbable membrane unless I'm using a biological agent such as bone morphogenic protein. Bone morphogenic protein doesn't like the membranes. Now the PDGF, there is a doc study uh, by Massimo Simeon and the PDGF he compared and he went, once he put a collagen membrane on the PDGF, it wasn't as good as without the collagen membrane. So even when you do PDGF and you have this membrane, you may not need to use a collagen membrane. However, if I use PDGF with a sausage, as I mentioned in my lecture, I would put the PDGF also inside, the, I mean, I would infiltrate the collagen membrane with the PDGF. And then you know, it would be very nice to run a study, but that's like, I cannot give you a perfect answer, but the best, answer based on the preclinical studies is that the biological agents should not be covered with the membrane and not even with the collagen membrane. So then, especially with the BMP, don't cover. In Europe, we 100% of the cases cover, if you use a normal bone graft, like we do back there, then you cover with the collagen membrane. Why? Because otherwise you will have more soft tissue ingrowth through the holes you know, more of a pseudoperiostem. Okay. All right, I think we'll wrap up with an implant question, Dr. Picos. Um, can you expand a little bit? You mentioned during a case a smaller diameter implant today for your anterior tooth replacement. How small is too small? When do you consider the, the extra platform shifts, shift, such as with the tapered plus? In other words, when do you use what size? Can you give some guidance on what size implants you're using? Well, the strength where? of our implants today are so, so good that, um, I mean, I just don't see any, uh, certainly with, uh, well, specific, specifically in the last 13 years using the BioHorizon system, I've seen absolutely no splitting of implants. Uh, that can occur potentially, but the long and short is 
we know wider is better for dissipation of forces and all that, but in the ascetic zone, for sure, a 3.8 diameter implant of most any system to 4, 4.1 is plenty good for a cuspid or a central incisor. For a lateral incisor, the 3.0, uh, 325, that range is, is ideal, optimal for whatever system you know, we're looking at. But a platform switch, uh, definitely uh, we utilize with the Tapered Plus, for example, um, and I think there's something to be said for that, in addition to, of course, the tissue thickness that we've all talked about uh, through these two days. And in the posterior? Posterior, um, I like uh, for molar replacement, a, a 5.0 or equivalent, even up to 5.8 has is, is been the implant I've used for the most part, uh, diameter, uh, with a platform switch. I can go wider, but the platform switch element is, is I think, important uh, as well. By cuspid, typically uh, a 4-0 plus minus uh, is good, again, depending on specific size of the tooth um, for that particular patient. Any comments on implant size for your? Yeah, very good question. I think for regeneration bone, regenerated bone, the best implant size would be not more than 4.0, okay? Unless it's a single tooth. If it's a single tooth, a five millimeter implant, I think you need for a molar. But for an average regenerated bone, I think, you know, anything like we use this, like we use what I showed was some, some of them were 4.0, some of them were 3, 375 is also a very good size. 4.3 starts to be more difficult. You need larger burrs, you need more burrs, and you consume more bone yeah. of the regenerated bone. So I like to have not more than a 4 millimeter in set. In fact, I would love to have a 3.8 perfect 3.8 implant that is passively fitting in the regenerated bone. It's a good connection, and I would love to have two of those. Actually, the 375, what I use, the Nobel Parallel, is I think is a very good implant for, for especially the anterior maxilla. For posterior, we use something I would like to have more like a hybrid, when I can guide the remodeling of the, of the mm -hmm. bone. Very final question. There were some questions about for, uh, continuing education. We know that your book is available with Quintessence Publishing. We know that your book is on its way this summer, and you both offer courses at your respective institutes. Can, uh, can we get access to videos? Do you all offer any videos if people wanted to uh, explore things further in terms of your surgical techniques? Um, I do have video access, yes. A um, um, video library. And who do they talk to? to? Um, our crew here, well, they're probably gone now, but <laughs> online, uh, Picos Institute, certainly. And yeah, we have, Dr. Urban? We have hundreds of videos, but not for sale. No, okay, <laughs> so we'll come to Hungary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, hope everyone enjoyed the two days. It's been a great two days. Thank you so much for your active participation and Thank questions. you so much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Thank you David. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. It's fun. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all of you for um, sticking around to the bitter end. Again, our goal in these three days together, including the workshops, was to share some of our clinical experiences from a little different perspective. And I'm hoping and I'm certain, judged by the feedback we've gotten already, that um, our goal uh, has been achieved. And again, I want to thank Dr. Urban for being available to us uh, for these days. And, and a round of applause for David Lee for being such a great moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank and you. to our AV crew once again, and my staff in particular, thank you for thank you all much. that you've done.